Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Study with us verse by verse to hear and heed his book, along with other topics of Bible prophecy. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so grateful we can come to you with everything that's happening in the world. First and foremost, that we can bless you, our almighty God and heavenly Father, who's in control, who's sovereign over everything in this world. Father, nothing happens that hasn't passed through your hands. And do you cause evil? No. Evil is a repercussion of sin in this world. But you know it's going to happen. You can allow it. You can stop it. It's according to your will. And Father, we come to you asking our request to you, but also praying according to your will. There's somebody in here that's looking at a business situation. That's in, it's all in your hands, God. We know what we want for that answer, but we pray your will be done. Father, there's people in here themselves or their family members who are really sick. God, you can heal anybody, but you don't heal everyone. So we entrust them to you. Father, there's all kinds of things going on with Russia and Ukraine and the future times of them coming, Russia coming up against Israel. We want war to stop because it's ugly and it's mean and it hurts people. But Father, it's part of the consequences of a sinful world. So we ask you to show your, shower your mercy and your grace on the people involved, both Russians and Ukrainians, because they don't, a lot of them don't want to be in that situation, even if they're in Russia. Father, pray most importantly that every single person comes to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior through this tragedy. That you touch their hearts, that your spirit goes and pours out your spirit on each one of them. And Father, we thank you that we can come to you at our time of need, that we can trust you, knowing that you have a purpose and a plan, and that you will cause things to work together for good for your glory for your purpose. Tonight, God, as we study chapter 10 of Acts, I pray that you'll open our heart to see, to see some things in our lives, but also to see the importance of this chapter and how the Holy Spirit has opened up to us because of what we see here. Thank you for that. Thank you for loving us enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to start First of all, as we always do with the theme of the book, which is from what? Where's it from in the book? Pardon me? Acts 1 8, which is, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and even the remotest parts of the earth. Power, Holy Spirit. He gives us the ability to be witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere. And that's what God calls us to do. That's the beginning of the church. But guess what? We are the church. And that calling has never been taken away from us. So with that, let's move to Acts chapter 10. It's a, in chapter 9, what did we learn about? Who did we talk about in chapter 9? Paul. What happened with Paul? On the road to Damascus. Yeah, he was radically saved on the road to Damascus. And do you remember what uh, God said to An Ananias, what Paul's calling was going to be? In Acts chapter 9, verse 15. He says, Go, for Paul is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name... Before whom? The Gentiles. the Gentiles and the kings of the earth and then the kings and the sons of Israel. So three different groups of people. Sons of Israel, that's natural because he's a Jew. Kings, well, that's not easy to do. But Gentiles. What was the attitude of the Jews towards the Gentiles? Unclean. The Jews saw the Gentiles as unclean. Did they socialize with them? Never. It was, they were not supposed to because they were unclean. That's why people were surprised when Jesus went and ate at Matthew's house. That's why we're going to see that people are surprised that Peter associated with the Gentiles. So if the Gentiles are unclean, how is it possible for the Jews to go minister to them? Power 
of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, it's not possible because they were told they were unclean, that the Gentiles were unclean. But now we're living under grace and not the law. So we're going to see tonight what the answer is. And, and as we come into this chapter, I want you to think of something. Is it, or is it now or has it been hard for you as a believer in Jesus Christ to ever give up any of your old religious practices or maybe your traditions that you were taught as a kid? And now I say that because think about it, at least for me, one of the things I was taught as a kid is you must go to church every Sunday. And in my Catholic religion at the time, I was told that if you don't, it's a mortal sin. And if you die in a mortal sin, you go immediately to hell. So we went to church every Sunday because we had to. They told us we had to. And I didn't want to go to hell. So went to church every Sunday until I got to a certain age where I rationalized out that that's ridiculous. You know, God's not going to send me to hell because I don't go to church. But did you hear that? It was my rationalization that came to that. The Catholic Church didn't change their philosophy. So when I became a believer in Jesus Christ, did I still have to go to church every Sunday? No, but you wanted to. Ah, there's the key. I didn't have to anymore, but I wanted to. So there's a difference when you want to do the things of the Lord rather than having to. But it was still hard to give up that n nagging thing in the back of my head that says, you need to be there every Sunday. If you're going to be a real true believer in Jesus Christ, you need to be there every Sunday. So sometimes it's hard for us to give up those traditions that we hold sacred. I'm going to throw out another one. I wasn't here, so I didn't, I didn't experience this, but I hear it happened a long time ago. When our current pastor came, we had communion one Sunday. And um, he used Oreo cookies for communion. Now, that blew a lot of people's minds to do that. And his purpose of doing that was, it's not the wafer that's sacred. It's the communion, the remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So sometimes we have to shake our traditions so we can focus on the truth and what things really mean. But that's not easy. A lot of people were mad. A lot of people left because they felt that was sacrilegious. Because it's hard to give up our traditions. They were doing. Oh, okay. Were you at that service that I'm talking about? Okay, so you know what happened that day. So he said that they, uh, yeah, they also talked about overseas, they use M&Ms and different things so people, so to hide what they were doing so that they wouldn't be persecuted. So sometimes it's hard to give up our traditions. But if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be open to what God wants, not what we think. And we can't hold on to traditions so sacredly that we lose sight of what God's trying to teach us. And that's a big lesson we're going to learn tonight as we open up Acts chapter 10. So join me as we look at the first two verses. We're going to be introduced to a new person named Cornelius. Cornelius. And it says up here, he's a devout Gentile. It goes on to say, now there was a man of Ces at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people <clears throat> and prayed to God continually. Now, based on what you're seeing here, was he a Jew? No. 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 How do you know that? He was a century. Yeah, yeah, because I tell you he's not a Jew. A okay. Well, let, let's look at scripture and figure it out. Right. He's a centurion. He's an officer in the Roman army. And he's a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. So he was in, from Italy, from that area. So he would have been a Gentile. Now, what is a centurion? Guard. Or okay, a soldier of over how many people? 100. How do we know it's 100? Century. Century is 100. Okay, so he was an officer over 100 men. And when it talks about the Italian cohort... Each division was made up of 10 cohorts of 600 men. That made, it made up a legion. So 10 cohorts of 600 men. And he was of the Italian cohort. So a legion was 6,000 people. And he was a centurion over 100 people. So he has an area of responsibility. 
but it's not like he's in charge of the whole army. Because 100 out of 6,000 is a smaller number. But if you don't have one person over a smaller number taking control of them and training them up and doing what they have to do with them, it'd be really hard to do it with all 6,000 people and one leader. So this guy was important. He had a sense of responsibility. First of all, what city was he in? Caesarea. Caesarea. What do you know about Caesarea at this time? And I should tell you the timing. This is about eight years after Pentecost. So we're 35, give or take, and when Pentecost happened, but we're give or take about 40 AD. What, what um, for those of you who've been to Israel and those of you who have studied it, what was Caesarea known for at that time? That's where the Romans had their, that was their city. That was considered basically a Roman city because the li Roman leadership always stayed in Caesarea. Pilate was there. He even had his name engraved on the theater that, was, that is still in that city. It was engraved on a seat. Herod's palace was there because that's where Herod would go and spend most of his time. He didn't like to be in Jerusalem. Pilate didn't like to be in Jerusalem. So it was the Roman area. The Roman ships came into that harbor. So it's not surprising that Cornelius, who's the uh, centurion, would, or the head of the a centurion of what is called the Italian cohort, would be stationed there. Now, obviously, they had some Roman guards in Jerusalem and all over the country. But Caesarea was known as the Roman city for that area where the people were. It says he was, a, in verse 2, he was a devout man who feared God with all his household. How was it possible back then for a Gentile to, fear, to really want to be part of or have an affinity towards the God of the Jews? Absolutely. He could have known about Jesus. He could have met Jesus. He could have heard, wanted to follow him because of what he'd heard. Uh, he also could have m known a lot of Jews and really respected the Jews he knew and came to know or wanted to know the God of the Jews. So you know, when, whenever you live somewhere, you're going to run into other people. Even though it was a Roman city, there were a lot of Jews that lived there. So he would have known a lot of Jews. Very good point. Very good point. She, she questions if a legion is 6,000 and there were legions of demons inside the demoniac that was in uh, Genereset, just on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, does that mean he was filled with thousands of demons? And if that was the case, were there thousands of pigs that these demons went into that ran down the hill? Could have been, because the legion is 6,000. Could have been. It opened your eyes up to new ideas of what scripture might mean elsewhere. So Cornelius, we've made the case. He's a Gentile, but he's a godly man. So he's obviously seeking God. Tells us in verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. And what time of the day is the ninth hour? Three o'clock p.m. That's when Jesus died. Three o'clock at the ninth hour. So he, he just thinking, sitting in his living room. It's the middle of the afternoon. He's relaxing, and all of a sudden, an angel walks in. Now that's kind of what it's saying here. Wherever he was, he was um, not expecting an angel to come in. Has any, have any of you ever seen an angel? And you know what? I don't know a lot of people that have, but this was clearly an angel, an angel of God, it says, and he came in and he called him by name and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, would you be alarmed too? Yeah. He said, what is it, Lord? Now, the question came up last week about Paul, Saul, when he was knocked off of his horse and he said, who are you, Lord? And the question was, did he know that that was Jesus? Well, this is an angel. Jesus is never called or described as an angel in the Bible, except the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. That's the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, but specifically the angel of the Lord. But he's never called an angel. So this is not an angel, and yet Cornelius calls him Lord. Why? That's a title of respect. Exactly right. Here comes somebody... He was not expecting that 
I mean, it says it's an angel. He obviously recognized him as someone special. And when you have someone special, you call them Lord. So perhaps that's why Saul called Jesus Lord was not so much that he recognized him as Lord, but as a, it was a sign of respect because he knew he was in the presence of someone special. The Lord also considered master. Yeah, Lord means master, absolutely. There were centurions that were followers of Jesus or wanted to know Jesus or believed in Jesus. And I don't see that there's any difference between centurions and what we have today. When you have groups of people that are all in the same office, for example, and they all have the same rank and they're all doing the same thing, they build relationships with one another. So you could see how centurions could too. And if, somebody, if it wasn't Cornelius who was at Christ's gravesite, one of his friends could have been and they could have told him about it. All right, so it says in verse 4, And fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Wow, wow is right. Are our prayers and alms, have they ascended as a memorial before God? Yeah, I believe they have. Yeah, aren't we incense? Absolutely. But to have an angel say that to you, we know that God knows each one of us by name. He counts the hairs of our head. We know that he loves us. We know we are members of his family. But back then, at that time, having an angel tell you that God knows you and God thinks about you, which is basically what he's saying, your prayers have ascended before the Lord, that would be pretty spectacular. If you know um, of any Jews, in, if you know many Jews, at least religious Jews, I've known several who have said, you know, I just, I have a hard time with my religion sometimes because our God, he's just a God of laws. He's not a personal God. That's how some Jews that I've talked to feel about God. It's just following rituals rather than knowing a God. And so here's a God sending an angel to tell Cornelius how important he is in God's kingdom. Pretty spectacular. Verses 6 Five through eight. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He's staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, how far is it from... Uh, well, you guys wouldn't know this unless you've, I've told you, driving it, it's um, probably about 45 minutes. But it is 30, where's my list? Huh, it's, well, I don't have it right here, but it's, it's like 36 miles. So think about it. If you walk two and a half miles an hour, say three miles an hour, 36, that's 12 hours. So it's, it's going to take you pretty much, it might take you a day to get there if you're the centurions and you leave early in the morning, or centurions' uh, servants. But most people, it's going to take two days to make this walk. But the point is, the minute he heard from this angel, what did he do? He, yeah, he sent his people. He obeyed. He followed what the angel said. Would you do that? You know, it's funny because a lot of times we want to justify or we want to say, oh, well, wait a minute, I'm having friends over for dinner. I'll deal with this tomorrow. <coughs> but when we're a devout follower of God, we want to take care of things just like God tells us to do. And he did. And he, today, of course, we'd pick up a phone or we'd text somebody. But dispatching your people to go 36 miles to a place that they didn't even know where they're going. They're going to look for Simon the Tanner by the sea? Well, that's a pretty big area. Even today, it's a big area. And Joppa, by the way, at that time, was the only, well, it wasn't. That and Caesarea were the two ports, but Joppa was the primary port for the people. Caesarea was for the Roman government and the ships coming in from Rome. So you're going to have lots of people there. Did they question? Oh, God, how are we ever going to find him? No. Did he tell his, his cohorts that it, we're going? Um, you know, you may not find him if you don't come on home. No. 
You're going to go there and you're going to find him. When God speaks, he's going to open every door. So these guys take off. They're going south to Joppa. And here's a map right here. Here's Joppa. Today, here's Jerusalem, to give you an idea. Today, this is just on the southern edge. It's, it's like Millard is to Omaha. It's on the southern edge of Tel Aviv. So Tel Aviv is right here. And that's Caesarea up there. So they're walking the plains. It's a flat land all the way up to Caesarea or down from Caesarea. So it's not that bad of a walk, but it's going to take some time. Why didn't God just send Peter up to Caesarea before Cornelius had the vision? Well, who knows, but God always has a reason. Always has a reason. And it's not always convenient. You know, it's not like we can just, God says, okay, Debbie, I want you to walk across the street and do this. Mm. It might be, Debbie, I want you to go to California and do this. Are we willing to listen? Yeah, I don't know what the chariot rules were, so it could have. Maybe they did send chariots. Maybe they did, except we'll see the timing is a little different on, on the way back. So I would venture to guess maybe they went on foot because it wasn't Roman business. But, well, it doesn't matter, quite frankly. It just is the fact that they did it. They obeyed their boss. And fortunately, it says uh, in verse, um, uh, where am I? Uh, verse 7. It says, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal tenants because it might be real tempting to say, what is this? You know, we're going on a wild goose chase. Except that, number one, you don't disobey your leader in the Roman legion or in the Roman cohorts. And number two, one of the guys that went with him was a devout soldier. So they're on their way down, or up. They're on their way down. Peter's in... Joppa. Just as a reminder, how did Peter get to Joppa? Do you remember from chapter 9? He was actually in Lydda, right here, which is Lod in the Old Testament, which is where the Ben-Gurion airport is. And the people of Joppa called him there so that he could raise uh, Lydia from the dead. Tabitha. Uh, Tabitha from the dead. And so that's why he was in Joppa. Verses uh, 9 now and 10. So on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. So if the ninth hour is 3 o'clock, what time is the sixth hour? Noon. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. Now, what difference does it make to us that he was hungry? <laughs> Why does God tell us that? You know, sometimes I, I, I wonder why God gives us the information he gives us. But he's got a reason for every little word that's in the scripture. But he tells us it was, um, that, that tells us, of course, that it's at noon uh, because he's desirous to eat. And while they were making preparations, he's thinking about food. He's hungry. Are they saying the key is here, he's focused on food. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but when you're doing something and you get hungry, it's hard not to be thinking about the food until you fill your tummy. So he was hungry, and, they, and he had a trance. It says he fell into a trance. That trance was, in verse 11, he saw the sky opening up and an object like a sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. All right, let's, how does this make sense? I mean, remember, Peter's hungry. So what comes down in the sheet? Food. If it was me, I'd think, okay, God, am I seeing this because I'm hungry? What was in the sheet? I often wonder how big the sheet was. I mean, it was the size of this room, or was the size of this block, I don't know. All sorts of animals that he wasn't allowed to eat. Because it says every, it says in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth, birds of the air. If you're familiar with the dietary laws of the Jews, they have very strict rules. According to Leviticus 25, I'm sorry, Le Leviticus 11, I'm not going to go back there and go through them with you. But they have very strict rules that they have to follow when it comes to their food. As a matter of fact, when you go over to Israel, 
All of their food in all of their restaurants are kosher. They have to follow the dietary laws because they don't know if the people coming in there are Christians or Jews or secular or religious or what. So the whole country, at least when it's Israeli owned, follows Jewish dietary laws, even today. So this comes down. Peter's hungry. I'm sure he's thinking, Is this, am I seeing this vision because I'm hungry? Does this have anything to do with food for lunch or what is happening? But that's what he sees is all of these animals. So his response is in verse, uh, well, the first, the instructions are a voice came to him saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Okay. Again, he's hungry. Is he supposed to eat one of these things for lunch? But Peter being the self-righteous guy that he is from all of his Jewish upbringing says, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again, a voice came to him a second time saying, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. All right. Unclean animals come down. And not only do they come down, but he is commanded, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And what's Peter's response? No way. No way. What does his response tell you about Peter? Devout. He was a devout Jew. Greg, is that what you were going to say? Yeah. Now, we don't know an awful lot about Peter except what we see in the Gospels just of how he reacts to things. But he was a devout Jew. Maybe that's why his brother came to him and said, we found the Messiah because he was looking for the Messiah. He was a devout Jew, and he said, I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. He followed the law, and he's still following the law. Now, we're eight years after the Holy Spirit has come upon people. We're eight years of freedom in Christ, and yet the Jews are still following their old traditions. Why? That's, you know, everything that's in my head tonight is coming out of your mouth. That is just absolutely what I was thinking the answer is. Because that's all he knew. That's all they knew. They didn't know to do anything else. They didn't realize they had a freedom in Christ. And that some of the rituals of the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant, God was changing like this one. And he was changing. He's taking right here... He is giving them the opportunity to now not have to do kosher. And let me give you another passage in Mark. In Mark chapter 7, it makes it perhaps a little clearer. And this was, um, let's see, Mark seven nineteen, And what it says is, Jesus speaking. Well, let me go with verse 18. And Jesus said to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. So Jesus right then is giving them the freedom to eat things that are not kosher. That was back when he was with them, but that's, they didn't understand that because they weren't used to that. Yeah. Yeah, Matthew says a very similar thing. It's not important what goes into your, mouth, into your mouth, but what comes out of it. So they had freedom, but they weren't living it yet because even though Jesus said it, they obviously didn't understand. He meant that they could eat whatever they wanted to. But God had given them that freedom. Freedom had said no until the angel had to give it to him. How many times? Three, Three. Three times he had to give him the vision. Are we that stubborn sometimes that we have to see something three times or hear it three times before we'll listen? Now, I say stubborn. You know, stubborn is one word to use. Maybe devout's the other word. He was so steeped in his traditions that it was hard for him to give up something that he knew was from God and that was changing now. That's, that's hard. It's hard sometimes for us to give up our traditions. But we have to remember, it's not the traditions that save us, it's Jesus that saves us. And we are in, right now, we are under the age of grace. 
We have freedom in Christ. We don't have all these dietary rules. As a matter of fact, um, there's a whole bunch of rules we don't have because I think I read this last week, but in Colossians chapter 2, Paul told them that they don't have to observe all the festivals and holidays. He says in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So uh, when we had a Jewish Messianic Jew here at a conference 10 years ago, he was asked, do Messianic Jews, Jewish people, Jewish heritage people who turn to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, do they need to follow the rituals of Judaism, Passover, the festivals, the new moons, all that stuff. And he said no. And he's using a scripture like this to say no, they don't need to do it anymore. We have freedom in Christ. Now we can. Matter of fact, tomorrow is beginning of Purim. And there's a lot of Christians who celebrate Purim because it's out of the book of Esther in the Bible. And because it's in the Bible, it's, it's a fun thing to celebrate. It's a happy, holy holiday. I do have to share one thing with you. I get a lot of uh, emails from Jewish sources. And the title of this email today was, The Joyous Festival of Purim Starts Tomorrow. And I opened up the picture, and it's a, uh, it must have been a nursing home. And there's about 10 people sitting in wheelchairs like this. And I thought, oh, the joyous <laughs> festival of Purim. <And> they're <laughs> but their hearts were joyous. <laughs> their bodies may not have been, but their hearts were. And it is a joyous festival. So I get out of, uh, get out of context here a little bit. When God says, when the voice says, the angel actually, in verse 15, when, when he says, what God has cleansed, cleansed net, let what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. Was he just talking about food? What was he talking about? Hmm? Gentiles. Gentiles. He was talking about Gentiles. And he'll tell us that later. But it took Peter a while to understand that. Because he's not eating unclean food, he's not eaten with Gentiles. Because that's unclean. He's following the law. And what God's showing him here is the law was for the Old Testament times for you people to follow until you have the substance of Jesus. And now things are different. Now that doesn't mean we throw the Old Testament out and say it's not of value anymore. Because it is. Why is it? Old Testament points to the new. Okay. The Old Testament points to the new. The Old Testament prophecies of Jesus Christ are fulfilled in the New Testament, and we have to have the whole package to understand it. And the Old Testament is the same God as we have in the New Testament, and we see him working throughout the whole, whole Old Testament in order to understand him working in the New Testament. So no, we do not disregard the Old Testament, and we will see that as we study Hebrews on Thursday morning and as we did here a few years ago. All right, now... The Spirit speaks to Peter. Peter starts to understand now, not from the angel, but the Spirit. You know, I was talking to somebody tonight, and I said, you got to pray about this, because only God can give you an answer for you. What might be right for you might not be right for me in the same circumstances, the same situation. That's why it's important to always seek God and always seek His Spirit to give us the answers He wants for us. So Peter did, it says in verse 17, now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what vision which he, as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate and calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. Put yourself in Peter's position and Peter's and Simon's position and the people who were in the house. Their position. Roman soldiers are coming to their door. Can that be a good thing? I know I can't. They didn't, they had a love-hate relationship with the, with the uh, Roman soldiers. Well, no, I guess that's not true. They had a hate relationship with the Romans. 
because the Romans were Gentiles and the Romans were their nemesis who'd taken over their country. And if the Romans came for you, you didn't have a choice. You had to go with them. You had to do whatever they said. Do you know, in Matthew, Jesus says, um, if somebody comes and wants you to walk with them a mile, walk with them a second mile. Mm-hmm. You remember when he said that? Do you know what that's referring to? Walk in their shoes. Well, walk in their shoes. But they had a law, a Roman law, that if a Roman soldier came to you and said, I want you to carry my backpack and my stuff, you had to do it. It was legal that you had to do it for a mile. And in Rome, on their Ignatius Way and the Roman roads, they had mile markers. And you were required by law to walk with them that mile. And Jesus says, walk with them a second mile. Go beyond what you're required to do. So the Jews really didn't care much for the Romans. And nothing good can happen when the sheriff knocks on your door. Right? (laughs) Well, that's what was happening here. And I'm sure that the disciples, who had no idea what Peter was going through upstairs, were wondering what was happening. But Peter, it says in verse 19, while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. That's the only way he'd answer the door, really. The Spirit showed him. He was seeking God's direction, and the Spirit showed him what was happening, and three men were coming to look for him. And then, verse 20, he's told, the Spirit says, But get up. Go downstairs and accompany them without what? Misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Don't be concerned about them. Don't worry about what they might do or what might happen. You go down and you greet them because I sent them. Well, that's all I need to hear. If somebody's going to come and put me in jail unjustly because Peter hadn't done anything wrong, well, except that he disobeyed the rulers up in Jerusalem by not by still talking about Jesus, but the Roman soldiers wouldn't be picking him up for that. But if somebody's coming to me and God says, go with them, and they're going to do something unjust, like put me in jail, if God says to go, I'm going to go. Because I don't know what God's plans are, but whatever they are, they're better than my plans by disobeying. So he says, I have sent those people. Well, no, he doesn't. He said, um, Behold, the three men are coming after the for I have sent them. Oh, oh, yeah, the Spirit is saying, I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for which you've come? That was a good question. He has no idea why they're there, why Roman soldiers are knocking on his door. But he knows he needs to answer the door and let him in. Then, or they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you, to come to his house and hear a message from you. So what did Peter do? Say, nope, I'm not interested. He's unclean. I can't go up there. Is that what he said? No. He invited them in. Does he still understand what's happening? Probably not. Now, he does know that the angel, uh, that someone has shown him this vision. He's had a trance. He does know that the Holy Spirit has spoken to him. He does know that he's supposed to listen to these people and do what they say. But he still doesn't probably know what's going on. And can you imagine the terror of having to uh, come to his house in Caesarea, to a Gentile's house, to a Roman centurion's house, In Caesarea, which is primarily Romans, that'd be a little terrifying. Unless, what? That's right. Unless the Holy Spirit is telling you to do it. Unless you trust God. Unless you trust God to know that he's in control. And he promises us, Romans 8, 28, that he will cause all things to work together for good to those who know God, to those who are called according to his purposes. Peter knew that. So he invited them in to the lodging, even though that was an anathema. However, remember, where was Peter living right now? At the Tanner's Tanner's house. And was that kosher? Uh, No, No, because he's with 
the tanner who's using, who's killing dead, who's killing animals and using their hides and tanning their hides. So he's unclean, which makes Peter unclean. And now he's doubly unclean because he has Gentiles in the house. Does he care? No. I can imagine the neighbors were whispering, look what he's doing. Look what's happening. Peter, he's supposed to be a, an apostle. And look what he's doing instead. He is not following God. He's not following the law. Do we listen to other people? No, we listen to the Lord. We don't let the whispers of other people make our decisions. We trust in the Lord to do what he tells us. And we seek him in making our decisions. Peter is an apostle. Peter is a follower of Jesus Christ. And now he's changing things. He's changing the Old Testament law. Except, is he? Is he telling other people to do this? Is he telling other people this is okay? Not yet. He's not, we're going to see that. And we're going to see what happens. But not yet. He's doing what God has called him to do. He's not saying everybody else has to do this yet. He's just doing what he has to do. And he's following God and not worrying about what other people are thinking. As a Christian, I mean, if I was there and I saw Peter doing, what, doing that, what would that do to my testimony? I, that's a, I, I think that's kind of what you're asking is, is he then the example that I need to give up all those old things? Well, if it were me, I would pray about it and say, God is what he's doing right. Is it from you? He's the apostle. He has the respect, but is it right? Is it what you want me to do? That's what I would say. Remember, we're at the beginning of the church. Everything is new. And they're finding out that, and, they're, and we're going to see a lot of other things that they question too, inclu including circumcision. Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. Why was Peter so devout about not eating an unclean animal, and yet he's staying with Simon the Tanner, who's unclean? I don't know. Maybe, maybe, I don't know this, I'm guessing. Maybe Simon the Tanner is a believer in Jesus Christ now. And that God has given him the, the ability to stay with him, but he just didn't put it in scripture to give him the freedom to stay with Tanner. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. But it is questionable why one thing and not the other. So let's see. Let's move on to, here we are, verses 20, the end of 23 on to 24. After he invited them in, he gave them lodging. And it says in verse 23, And on the next day, he got up and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now, perhaps this is the very reason why Peter was in Joppa, because it tells us later he had six men go with him. There were three of Cornelius's men, and Peter brought six with him. <laughs> There's comfort in numbers there. So I didn't think Peter did that in anticipation of fighting the centurions. But um, Peter was all, all the disciples were always, excuse me, all the apostles were about discipling people. And what's the best way to disciple them? You bring them along with you to see what God's doing so they can see it, so they can turn closer to God, so they can witness it and be about doing those things for the Lord too. So on the following day, he entered Caesarea. Now that tells me it took them two days to get to Caesarea because they left the next day and then the following day they entered Caesarea. And I can imagine that Peter was doing an awful lot of praying at this point because he was going into a very difficult situation. And whenever that happens, we need to be prayed up because we don't know what those situations are going to be like. We don't know what we're going to be asked to do or required to do. We don't know why God wants us there. We don't know the outcome, but God does. So imagine Peter was prayed up, and it says here in verse 24, On the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together who? Relatives and close friends. Now, have you ever called together relatives and close friends to bring them together to hear somebody share the gospel or to speak about God? I mean, look at Cornelius. He may be a devout man, but he had the courage to bring these Gentiles together to hear a Jewish guy talk about God. And if you're like, you know, most friends and relatives, 
generally go, I don't want to talk. I don't want to go to one of your preachy things. But they came. He invited them and he had enough stature with them that they came. Maybe they knew who they were going to hear from. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they were curious. Who knows? But, they, but he invited and they came. You know, it says he was devout. It doesn't say the family was devout or the friends were devout. He was. Yeah. Well, this is eight years after uh, Pentecost. So obviously the word's gotten around. They have spread now. The, the, the spreading of the gospel has gone to Samaria. We've already read about that in chapter 8, I think it was, um, how the gospel gone to Samaria, which is north and east of here. And so people are probably knowing who the apostles are. And maybe Peter and John more so because they're the ones that <laughs> got kicked out of the synagogue and, or the temple and were chastised by the leaders. And so I imagine the reputations preceded them. It's been a long time and, and word travels very fast, and especially in Caesarea. The Romans knew everything that was going on. They knew who was causing trouble. They knew the uprising of Jesus Christ and what it could potentially cause in the region. And they were responsible to keep everything calm. So they, they might well have known. But maybe not. Maybe this is the first time Cornelius has ever heard of Peter. Oh, those are great observations. And the main observation he made is that we're told at the very beginning of this chapter that this is what Cornelius had been praying about. So maybe he'd been praying for his friends and his family. Maybe he'd been praying that he would somehow understand what was going on with Jesus the Christ or, or whatever. But he was praying about this. Are you praying for your family and your friends? Are you praying that God will open opportunities for them to know Jesus Christ? And if you are, are you open to whatever opportunities God gives you? Here the angel came in a, a dream or whatever right in front of him to give him an opportunity. And Cornelius seized on that because it was an answer to his prayer. You know, I pray for a lot of things, but it's kind of like, God, I'm praying for this and this to happen. Do it in your way out there. You know, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to be involved in it. You do it. You save them. Well, maybe God wants me to invite them somewhere. Maybe God wants me, as I'm praying for them, to do something that will give them the gospel message. And if that's the case, am I listening? Is God answering my prayer and giving me an opportunity? And am I doing it? And it doesn't have to be me. Cornelius didn't share the gospel with him. He called in a preacher to do it. It doesn't have to be us but we might be the conduit. Good observation, Joe. Thanks for sharing those. <laughs> Moving on now. Um, well, let me back up. Uh, when, when he called his friends and relatives in verse 24, and they were there with Peter, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. So that tells us that Cornelius knew that Peter was a man of God. Whether he knew all about Peter being an apostle of Jesus Christ whether the angel told him, whether the spirit told him, I don't know. But he knew that Peter was a man of God and he fell down to worship him. Is that what we are to do to godly, in front of godly people? No. And Peter was clear. Verse 26, Peter raised him up and said, stand up. I too am just a man. You know, one of the things I love in the book of Revelation, there's three examples in that book where John fell down to worship an angel. And the angel said, no, worship God. We are never to worship men. All too often we get so, well, we go beyond respectful and admiring of our pastors and we start worshiping them. Or certain religious leaders, you know, the Billy Grahams or something. And we start thinking that they're, higher and above, and they're worthy of worship. They're not. Worthy of respect? Yes. Worthy of honor because of their position? Yes. But never of worship. We worship God and God alone. And that's what Peter's saying here. Peter knew his position. Nowhere do I ever see Peter getting arrogant and taking uh, the lead and saying, wow, you know, look at who I am. Never. He's always pointing to God. Now, P 
Peter begin, he says now that he understands that vision that he had. We didn't hear it back when he had the trance, the vision, but we do now. In Acts 10, 27, it reads, And he talked with him, as he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. God has shown Peter. Now, he hasn't necessarily shown that to Paul yet, who's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. At least we haven't seen that he's made that clear to him because he's still going to the synagogues to preach. But he has shown Peter that no man is unholy or unclean. It's Peter's responsibility to share Christ with everybody. That's why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So what he's saying is, you know, you're a Roman. You have no legal right to bring me here. But I didn't raise an objection because I knew it was God leading me. And I knew he wanted the gospel shared with the Gentiles. He said, so I ask for what reason have you sent for me? Good question. Why am I here? God told me to come. You called me. God told me to come. I'm here. Why? And that's when Cornelius recounts his vision. This is such an interesting passage because it goes through Peter's vision. And then Peter recounts his vision. And then Cornelius' vision. And Cornelius recounts his vision. We keep hearing the same thing over and over here. Why is that? What? So it sinks in. What sinks in? What does God want us to get? Okay, Gentiles are okay. Absolutely, obedience is a must. Look what I, God, can do and will do if you will trust me. Are you willing to change, give up some of those old things that you have, have become so legalistic about and use them in the right way, not in, a, in your way or in how you see they want that you want them to be. Peter is having to give up these traditions and it can't be easy. But when God calls you, you must obey. So here Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. We get a little bit more there now. He's in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. And again, that's what Joe just said. His prayers have been heard. Are you praying? Has God heard your prayers? Is he calling you to do something in response to that? Therefore, send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. For he's staying at a house, at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. And that's exactly right. Peter didn't have to go. He was kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you've been commanded by the Lord. Peter said, why am I here? And he says, you're here, present before the Lord. So we're all here so we can hear what God has to say through you. Cornelius knew that's why he was calling Peter. Peter didn't know that's why he was being called. But he was obedient and he was ready. Do you know the Bible says always be ready to give an account for the joy that's in you? Always be ready. You never know when you're going to get called. And you can't go, well, you know, give me three or four days so I can study the scripture and find out what the answers are. You have to go. How can we go into unknown places to share Christ when we aren't expecting it, when we aren't prepared? Okay, I heard somebody say the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. The Holy Spirit guides us and leads us. Well, Scripture says that God will give us the words to say at the moment we need to say them. So he'll give us the words. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He's our guide. He knows what those people need to hear. And he's the one that can guide us to say those right things. Got to trust God. And we also have to be walking with the Spirit. All the time. If we are walking in the ways of the world and God calls us to do something, where are we going to get our power? 
Well, it's going to be tough to get it from the Spirit when we're pushing the Spirit away. God wants us always to be walking with Him. Continuous, ongoing walking with Him. So that we're ready at any opportunity He gives us. We don't know what those opportunities are going to be. Could be anytime, anywhere. That's why he was summoning Peter. And did Peter say, well, I'm not ready. I'll, you know, let me go pray about it and I'll come back to you when I really know what God wants me to say. You don't have to say anything except the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, and, and hopefully all of us know what that gospel message is about who Jesus is. That's all we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's all we have to say. And Peter knew that, and that's pretty much all he did say. In ver However, he does start out in something very interesting. In verse 34, he says, Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to what? Show partiality. What is partiality? Thank you, thank you. Favoritism. Favoritism. Favoritism for one or the other. What's he talking about here? Favoritism of whom over whom? So is God just now, <coughs> excuse me, is God just now showing that he doesn't show partiality? Is this something new with God? No. If you look at Deuteronomy ten seventeen, it says, And I took hold of the two tablets. Well, that's in the wrong chapter. Ten seventeen. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. It's an interesting addition there, but the point is, God doesn't show partiality. The book of Deuteronomy was given by Moses to the people of Israel before they went into the promised land. Forty years after they first got the covenant from God. And he tells them God doesn't show partiality. In uh, James chapter 2 verse 9 says the same thing. Old Testament, New Testament. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressions, transgressors. We are not to show partiality at all. And that's why God said in Acts chapter 1, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. No partiality. Yeah, he says Jew first. Those are God's chosen people. God doesn't show partiality. God doesn't show partiality. Aren't you glad? Because if he showed partiality and he stuck with his Old Testament people that he called under his covenant and said, well, I'm not going to worry about the Gentiles, where would we be? We would not be here. We would not be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, but in every nation, the man who fears God and does what is right is welcome to him. Good examples. How Jesus didn't make distinctions between the rich man and the poor man. And how he didn't, didn't make distinctions as to who he healed and who he didn't heal. There's no partiality with God. I'm so glad to know that I'm on the same level as my pastor. Or Billy Graham. Or... Any great people of the Lord because there's no partiality with God. I'm so glad to know that his chosen people, the Jews, that I'm on the same level with them. Because I know how much he loves them. So what does that tell you about how he feels about me? That's a long answer. But I will give you a short answer to your question. Her question is, where then do different houses in heaven come in? And that comes in based on how we have served God here on earth. If you study the parables of the talents, you get the idea of different uh, rewards in heavens and things. And we receive rewards based on the things that we have done for God, for his glory here on earth. So when we get to heaven, you know, the Billy Grahams in heaven might have a million rewards and I might have one. I'm still in heaven and I may not have the same house he does, but I'm in heaven and I won't care. He may have different responsibilities than I do. That's okay. It's not God's partiality that does that. It's our response to God that makes that decision. It's the same thing with who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. God's not partial to anyone. He wants everyone to be saved. But people will decide not to follow Jesus and they will go to hell. 
They made that decision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we now are moving on to verses 36 to 37 to see what Peter says to Cornelius and his friends. It says, the word which he sent to the sons of Israel, he's talking about God because he mentions him in the previous verses. The word which God sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. After all, Jesus is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting with Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. Now here we have a little insight into Cornelius because he said, you yourselves know. So they did know whether they knew exactly who Peter was or exactly the circumstances that were going on. They knew what had happened with Jesus because everybody knew. And it says, starting with Gal uh, the Galilee, from the Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God appointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So he's just simply proclaiming Jesus. If we ever get in a spot and we don't know what to say, proclaim Jesus. You can't go wrong because that's the sermon content that each one of the apostles used in the book of Acts when they were talking to people. We are witnesses, Peter and maybe some of the people with him, of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on the cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So what is Peter's message? Gospel. The gospel, the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection. First of all, who Jesus Christ is. The death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, plain and simple. And then he goes on to say, he ordered us to preach because he had said, in verse 39, we're witnesses. He ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who had been appointed by God as a judge of the living and the dead. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who does what? Believe. Believes in him, receives the forgiveness of sins. This is a faith alone passage, folks. Everyone who believes in Jesus is forgiven of their sins. No rituals, no additions, faith alone. So Peter gives them the gospel, tells them about Jesus, gives them the gospel message, and then tells them what they need to do to receive Jesus. And that is simply to believe. And I say simply, uh, in our Tuesday, Thursday class, one of the gals was talking the other day about uh, praying a prayer and how so many of us think, well, I just prayed a prayer at church or with somebody, so therefore I'm automatically saved. Nowhere in scripture does it say that you're saved by a prayer. A prayer is an outward saying of what's in your heart already. If you look at the thief on the cross, Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Did that guy pray a prayer? Did Jesus say to him, well, you have to pray a prayer and, re you have to pray a prayer and repent and receive me as your Lord and Savior, and then you can be with me in paradise. Did he say that? No. He did not. So why do we pray a prayer? Why do we you say, come forward and you can pray to receive Christ? Why do we say that? That's right. It's, it's, in a way, it's like baptism because it's an outward sign acknowledging that you've already made an inward decision in your heart. The inward decision, believing in Jesus as the Messiah who died for our sins and rose from the get dead, that's what saves us, the belief. And it's not the head belief. That's, that's only part of it. It's the heart belief of truly acknowledging Jesus as Lord. That's what belief means. Belief is the word pistis, and it really has a three-pronged meaning, which means an acknowledgement of who Jesus is, that he's God, that he's our Savior, and then a surrender to Jesus as Lord, recognizing him for who he is, and then a conduct that becomes our relationship with Jesus Christ. 
all three of those are the three-pronged stool of what faith really is. It's not head knowledge. I know who Jesus is. He's this and that. And I read it in my catechism and I memorized it. No, that's not it. And it's not working for Jesus. That's works. It's a belief in your heart. So Peter is telling them, simply believe in him. It's very easy, but don't think that the ritual of praying the prayer saves you because it doesn't. It's the belief in Jesus Christ with the acknowledgement of praying a prayer to acknowledge your belief that saves you. Pardon me? It's personal. Your prayers give you a peace. Open peace. Hope and peace. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's an outcome, an outgrowth of our relationship, our faithfulness, our belief in Jesus Christ as the conduct and prayers give us that faith and peace. So P, Peter's very clear here. He doesn't say prayer, prayer. He doesn't say go get baptized. He says believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, they are going to get baptized, but well, that's an outgrowth. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, what happened? The Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. Now, how can the Holy Spirit fall on people? What has to happen to those people for the Holy Spirit to fall on them? They have to believe in Jesus. Did they pray a prayer? No. Did they have anything else happen? Peter said, you have to believe and the next thing that happens, the Holy Spirit falls on them. For each one of us who believe, we've received the Holy Spirit. Not because we asked for him. And I don't know about you, but I didn't know to ask for the Holy Spirit when I became a believer. Because God promises the Holy Spirit to be his helper, our helper, when Jesus left. So the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. That doesn't just mean that, okay, everybody's in the room, they heard the message, and they were saved. Uh, I mean, the Holy Spirit fell upon them automatically. Mm -hmm. Means they heard the message and clearly the message spoke to their hearts. And with their hearts, they believed as Peter had told them. And then they all received the Holy Spirit. That'd be pretty exciting. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed. Why? Well, I think they thought that the Holy Spirit was just for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That they had experienced the Holy Spirit at the time of Pentecost, which is a Jewish holiday, and that they thought it was just theirs. But it's not. It's for anybody who will believe. So they were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Well, I can imagine because Gentiles again were an anathema to the Jews and now all of a sudden they're seeing the Jews, the Gentiles receive the same Holy Spirit. What is God doing here? This is a lot bigger than us folks is what they're probably thinking. You know, we got to learn a lot more of what God's expecting of us right now because we were not expecting this. I'm throwing my thoughts into this. This isn't what the Bible says. That's right. So that tells me, it tells me for one thing that there were other people other Gentiles who feared God. They really wanted to understand this God of the Jews or this new God, to them a new God, because they might not have understood the Messiah and the promises of the Old Testament. But they feared God. God had put that fear in their hearts. Was this a fear that they were scared to death of God? No, no fear is phobos, respect, honor, worship of the God. And he did. As his family. Good point. So it says that they fell on the, the people realized, they saw, they were amazed at what God was doing. For they were hearing them speaking with what? Tongues and exalting God. So these Gentiles believed, received the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, and were exalting God. Is that any different than Pentecost? Now, well, there was a whole bunch of other stuff that happened at Pentecost because the Bible tells us it did. But in general, this is the same thing that happened at Pentecost, except the Pentecost happened to what group of people? The Jews. And now we're seeing it to the Gentiles. So this experience here has opened the gospel to us for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed to the Gentiles and open to the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit to be received by the Gentiles. 
So when Peter saw this, he answered and said, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? In other words, we're going all the way here. God's doing a miraculous thing, and we're going to do everything we can to show other people that these Gentiles have been saved. They received the Holy Spirit. That was a result of salvation. They now are going to be baptized, which is the outward sign. You don't just take people with you to, dis to disciple them, but you take them as witnesses so they can see what has happened too, and they can then be witnesses to share with other people the miraculous things God's doing. And clearly from the way this transpired, Cornelius having a vision, Peter having a trance, he wanted witnesses to see what was going to happen. Did Peter have an inkling? I don't know, but he knew something big was going to happen. It tells us then in 46 to 48 that they were baptized. He said, can we refuse them baptism? And he ordered them to be baptized in what? In the name, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's identifying with salvation with Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. So now, for the first time ever, the Gentiles are grafted into the kingdom of God and his promises. Wow. That's pretty spectacular. But with that idea, let's go to Romans 11, where it specifically uses that terminology. In um, Romans 11, well, it's a big passage. There's a lot here, but I just want you to hear it. Starting with verse 11. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? And this is talking about the Jews. May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. So God has given us salvation to make the Jews jealous of what God was willing to do with everybody, the Jews and the Gentiles alike. Now, if their transgressions be riches for the world and their failure be riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? That means when the Jews truly turn to Jesus Christ. But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. So Paul was happy to go to the Gentiles in hopes that the Jews would see this and want what the Gentiles had. Verse 15. For if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world, and this is the Jews' rejection, what will their acceptance be but life from death? That's telling us the Jews can still come and accept. And if the first piece of dough be holy, and the lump is also, and if the root be holy, the branches are too. So the first piece of dough, the covenants, the root, if that's holy, then all of us who are grafted in the branches, we're holy too. Verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, the Gentiles, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. Don't be arrogant, Gentiles, towards the Jews. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. And that is that we, as Gentiles, are grafted into the covenant promises that God made with Israel simply by believing. That grafting, do you know how hard it is to graft a branch into an existing tree? I mean, I, I'd say it can't be done, but I've seen it that it has been done. But it's really tough. That's a good observation here. What he said is that each one of these people and people groups that we've seen in the book of Acts so far have had a supernatural occurrence happen to them. Supernatural. This isn't just your daily thing that happens. When they've received the Holy Spirit, they've been speaking in tongues, hands have been laid on them, they've been baptized. Supernatural experiences. And he makes mention that several of the people that have been saved, that we've seen saved, are from the three different children of Noah. So we're seeing a reason why God is doing what he's doing in the book of Acts. And why he's doing these miraculous things with the people that he's doing these miraculous things with. But we're not finished. We've got more to see, and I can't tie this all together until later on when we get to the last group of people that God wants to do a supernatural work with, besides, of course, all the people that Paul is going to see. And when that happens, we're going to tie all these supernatural events and talk about why they happened and the timing of them happening and what God's doing with it.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She was in Jesus' list. So was Ruth, and she was a Gentile. Well, I won't say she was a Gentile. She was not of the family of Abraham. She was of the lineage of Abraham, long way, but not of the family. So, yeah, so here we see you and I, as Gentiles, having the opportunity to be brought into the kingdom of God. We are no longer excluded from his covenants that he made with the Jewish people, but instead grafted in. And because of that, and because Paul became a go- uh, an apostle of the Gentiles, the Gentiles kind of took over the church, made it easier to make the transition from some of the Old Testament practices as the Gentiles took over the direction of the church. Not yet, not for a while, because the gospel started in Jerusalem, and then it spread to Judea and Samaria, that's still Israel, but then when it starts going out to the remotest parts of the earth, beginning here, things are going to change. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is for everybody. There's no partiality with God. It's for the rich, it's for the poor, it's for the righteous, it's for the murderers. It's for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles, it's for the Methodists, it's for the Muslims. It's for everybody. God has no partiality. Now the question is, are we taking the heart as Peter did and sharing that gospel message? Folks, I can't say it enough, but we're living in times that people throughout the last 2,000 years have wanted to live in, and that's seeing the return of Jesus Christ. Now, it may not happen in our lifetimes, but it's going to be soon. And he, God's got us here so that we can be the people sharing the gospel with those who need to know before the tribulation period starts, before the rapture of the church takes place, and we're all gone. And there's not going to be Gentiles to share with other Gentiles in the tribulation period. Now is the time. I have a tendency to say, but I'm not an evangelist. Each one of us is an evangelist. With the gifts that God has given us, we share the gospel in the ways that he calls us to do. The question is, are you willing to be a vessel of God's to do that? Are you walking with him? Are you willing every day to get up and say to God, show me my sins that I can confess them before you and I can turn to you and walk with you? so that we can be his vessels to use whenever he opens a door for us. Because we never know when that's going to be. We're in unique times. And unique times calls for unique things to happen. And maybe we're going to see some of these miracles that we're seeing in Acts happen again before Jesus returns. Do you want to be part of some of those? So that you can know that you're serving God and people are coming to Christ? Don't look for miracles. I mean, I, some people just look for miracles. Let's just look for Jesus Christ to work in us and through us. Heavenly Father, you have reminded us tonight of the importance of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to know nothing else. We can use our testimony of how we came to Christ, but we really don't need to say anything to anybody except that Jesus is God. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead to conquer death. And all we have to do is believe in him and surrender our lives to him. That's it. That's as simple as that. So, Father, give us opportunities to be able to share that with other people. And, God, if they accept you, we're going to say, praise the Lord that you have opened that door and drawn them to you. And if they don't, we're going to know that we've dropped some seeds that you might use at a later date. It's not about us. It's about you. And we want you to be glorified, and we want people to come to know you, Jesus. Because it's not your will that any should perish, and it's not ours either, as your children, but that all should come to the knowledge of repentance. Use us, Father, to be part of your plan. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining Living Word Ministries. Living Word Ministries is a viewer-supported program. Please visit www.livingwordministry.org for more Bible studies and information. And please join us again for Living Word Ministries.